cyber espionage, a form of cyber attack that involves spying and theft of sensitive data or information, the kind of information that's kept from being publicized as it can pose a serious threat to the victim. In this case, nations are often victims of other nations planning to steal information in the hopes of gaining intelligence that can be used against their targets. Before cyber attacks were a method of extracting information, spies used to physically go on dangerous missions into enemy territory and were usually taken advantage of during large-scale wars. An infamous case of espionage is the Rosenberg case that took place during the Cold War, when Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, American citizens, were caught spying on behalf of the Soviet Union. The existence of the internet and utilizing it as a method of entry into the digital space of other countries has since replaced such attempts at infiltration. And generally, this is considered safer than sending in spies physically, who, if caught, may be interrogated and extracted information out of. Plausible deniability and thereby avoiding retaliation is by far one of the greatest advantages of using such a method, provided it's not carried out in a sloppy manner. But here's the thing. Cyber espionage generally isn't sloppy, because these are carefully selected, trained cyber criminals, financially backed by their governments, and know exactly how to fly under the radar. Large nations such as the United States, Russia, China, and North Korea are commonly accused and targeted in cases of cyber espionage, mainly because these nations consider each other major threats in warfare and or cyber warfare. Between the years 2003 to 2006, the United States government faced such an attack, one that, quote, ranked amongst the most pervasive cyber espionage threats that US computer networks had ever faced. The US government codenamed this attack Titan Rain. Internet vigilantism is the name given to those that enact justice on wrongdoers through the use of the internet, generally without express permission from the law. Kind of like Batman, but in the cyberspace instead. One such internet vigilante in the early 2000s was Sean Carpenter, somewhat of the protagonist in this story. A Navy veteran who at the time was a network security analyst at Sandia National Laboratories, a nuclear security administration R&D lab based in the US. His story began when in 2003, Lockheed Martin, which was the parent company of Sandia Labs at the time, and a major defense contractor of the US military, started to realize that they may have suffered a breach as hundreds of their computers started to shut down by themselves. Sandia Labs then dispatched Sean, as well as a few colleagues of his, to figure out what was happening. And so they set off on a flight out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, to a branch of Lockheed Martin in Orlando, Florida. Before long, they discovered rootkits planted in their computer systems. Rootkits, for those unaware, are softwares that are generally designed for malicious purposes and allow attackers to remotely control the target system, allowing them to spy and steal data. And to make matters worse, these rootkits actively attempted to hide themselves from detection, not just from the user, but even from antivirus softwares. The rootkits hidden in the Lockheed Martin systems evidently had amassed sensitive data, and as Sean and his team had come together, were ready to be sent out to a server in China. Nevertheless, this wasn't investigated at the moment. Sean and his team were congratulated on a job well done and flown back to New Mexico, back to Sandia Labs. At which point, Sean requested to hack back the intruders and find out more about what they wanted. A request which, to Sean's dismay, would be rejected by his superiors, citing a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and unwilling to draw further attention from the attackers. Later, in an interview with Computer World, Sean stated that one of his supervisors would hear his case and say, we don't care about any of this. We only care about Sandia computers. Sean was understandably crushed by this decision, but that didn't discourage him from probing further. He began an independent investigation into the intrusion at the comfort of his home, putting on his proverbial mask and investigating the attackers. He did this by placing what's called a honeypot. Honeypots are essentially bait generally used defensively by organizations to study cyber criminals by luring them to intentionally vulnerable systems. Sean would create a honeypot filled with bogus, sensitive data and fabricated search histories to attract these Chinese cyber spies, and it worked. A little after he had set up the honeypot, the targets, those that matched Sean's profile of the attackers, took the bait. It was 10 long months of tracing the attackers, 
These were masters of their craft and clearly wanted to avoid any risk of being traced back, using encryptions and VPNs and multiple hop points. But eventually, Sean traced them back to a server in South Korea. Brute forcing his way into the server, he discovered that it was loaded with sensitive stolen documents, including blueprints from the F-22 Raptor and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, both major projects belonging to a familiar name, Lockheed Martin. Additionally, when further investigated, they had files that belonged to the US Army, aviation mission planning systems and flight planning software. However, Sean would come to find that this South Korean server was also nothing but a hop point, and the final destination of the network, where it all led to, was in Guangdong, China. Sean silently left a bug on the router, which would ping his anonymous email account. He'd get a message each time a connection was made. And in just two weeks, he had over 20,000 messages. Now that he had finally found the perpetrators, Sean had a new problem. He was never authorized to do this and he knew that he was involved in doing something illegal. So where would he submit this information to? The files that he uncovered in the servers of the cyber criminals were clearly dangerous in the wrong hands. But who could he inform them of without the risk of ending up in prison and losing his job? Or any future jobs in the field for that matter? But if he didn't inform anyone, there was the chance of putting his nation at a great deal of risk. He eventually braved his fears and reached out to some of his contacts in the army, who would then pass it on to the FBI, where an agent named David Raymond would take the case. According to The New Yorker, Raymond was astounded by the findings and was in particular troubled by how he had obtained them. This was good news, and by October of 2004, Sean had begun working with the FBI as a confidential informant to look further into the case. But only a few weeks later, he was told to stop digging till they got more authorization, while in the next four months, he provided an analysis of his previous findings to the FBI. According to Raymond, Sean's research reached the highest levels of FBI counterintelligence and was told that there were eight open cases throughout the United States that his information was being provided to. During this time, Sean was given assurances that they were going to take care of him and that he wouldn't be prosecuted even going as far as to say that they had a letter from the Justice Department promising not to charge Sean with hacking. However, Sean and his wife, Jennifer Jacobs, who was working at Sandia Labs at the time as well, was understandably skeptical and worried about the verbal agreement. And so, Sean began to bug his house, recording his interactions with the FBI. Turns out his doubts were warranted, as in March of 2005, the FBI would seize all communications with Sean and report their secret meetings to the head of counterintelligence at Sandia Labs, Bruce Held, a retired CIA officer. Here's a disturbing excerpt from the interview between Sean and Computer World that describes what happened next. During my last meeting with Sandia management, a semicircle of management was positioned in chairs around me and Bruce Held. Mr. Held arrived about five minutes late to the meeting and positioned his chairs inches directly in front of mine. At one point, Mr. Held yelled, you're lucky you have such understanding management and if you worked for me, I would decapitate you. There would at least be blood all over the office. During the entire meeting, the other managers just sat there and watched. At the conclusion of the meeting, Mr. Held said, your wife works here, doesn't she? I might need to talk to her. Sean was stripped of his Q-Security clearance and fired from his job. Later, Sean would even come to find that while he was helping the FBI investigate the attackers, the FBI was investigating him. Sean Carpenter would go on to sue Sandia National Laboratories for defamation and wrongful termination, a lawsuit which he would go on to win, with $4.3 million awarded to him, as well as an additional amount of almost $400,000 for costs incurred. This was more than twice the amount that Sean and his lawyer had asked for. The jury seemed to unequivocally side with Sean in this case, stating that he was a patriot and did what he did to protect the national interest. Regardless of his courtroom victory, Sean knew that this was the end of his journey with Titan Rain, despite not being entirely fulfilled with the result. I'm not sleeping well. I know the Titan Rain group is out there working, now more than ever. He knew that the attack originated from China, and maybe he knew more, but this was all that was revealed at the time. Later on, in August of 2005, the US government attributed the 2004 attacks to the People's Liberation Army 
Unit 61398, an armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. China State Council Information Office would however tell time that the accusations were totally groundless, irresponsible and unworthy of refute. It was also revealed that no classified information was stolen in this espionage attempt, but that the unclassified information can prove to be harmful by revealing the strengths and weaknesses of the United States. This turned out to be a turning point for the level of sophistication that Chinese cyber criminals were capable of showing. At the time, China wasn't a major consideration or competitor when it came to cyber warfare, and Titan Rain turned out to be the first publicly Chinese state-sponsored cyber espionage event against the United States. Unit 61398, also classified under APT-1, was called the Chinese equivalent of the American NSA. According to a report by the Mandiant, they had evidence that attributed hundreds of terabytes worth of information stolen since 2006 from at least 141 organizations, of which 115 were from the United States. Now, I want to be very clear when I say that just because the Titan Rain incident was attributed to the PLA, there's really nothing that we the public can use to confirm this attribution, in terms of whether it really did come from China or the US government simply made a mistake. As I said earlier, one of the greatest benefits of cyber espionage is plausible deniability, and no retaliation from the US government was ever specifically tied to this incident. But I would love to know what you guys think in the comments below, as well as any ideas for the next story you'd like for me to cover. Thanks for watching the TWS channel. Cheers.